<coughs> okay. Welcome back, internet people. It's time for more scanning. Ooh, and I need to lift this up somehow. If you'll excuse me. So my scanning setup, it's awful. I was trying to use an actual flatbed scanner earlier today, but man, that just wasn't working out. I definitely have much more appreciation for people who archive things professionally. That's for darn sure. Anyway, I'm back with more scanning pain adventures. If I can make this line up, I will be a happy camper. Okay. Now I just... So, I can't show you because the webcam is doing its thing. But I, I just have a webcam, you know, on a, on a stack of stuff from my office. So, really coming at this professionally. <laughs> like I was saying, I was trying to use a flatbed scanner, but... Printers and me have a long adversarial relationship, so webcam it is. Anyway, so a little bit ago, I was showing scanning of just other Ejnosht cards, the Eastern Guide to Birds. Um, I explained a lot of information about Ejnosht cards in general during that stream. This time I'm scanning the other pack that I have that I need to preserve, and these are different. They're more indicative of what you normally have when you're dealing with edge-notched cards. Um, rather, this is a more common application. So these are note cards. Uh, gotta adjust again. These are note cards from a chemistry lab that were used. So with these cards, you can see more of what an everyday user of edge notch cards would see. Um, these are these first few are a great example because they don't have any notching in them, um, which is how you get it. You just get a card. These have some of the well, let me flip that around. Um, some of the indexing information on the back, just like in general, what these fields could be. If you notice. They use 7421, which that's an American coding. By punching a combination of one to two holes in those fields, you can add up to, what, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So basically, you can do a 0 through 10 number in one of these fields. But instead of using 10 holes, you just use 4. So that's one of the just interesting details about how these cards functioned. The other interesting thing that you can see on these first few cards that I'm scanning in is what's actually on the face. So, of course, a blank one just comes with lines. Some of them come as more forms, but these are just note cards. But these specific notes, this is an index. So this is showing a category index of different materials. I haven't looked through this stack a whole lot. This is just came in very recently, so it's going to be kind of a learning experience. But from what I remember, when I briefly scanned through these, these are, like I was saying, a category field. So once we get into the stack further and start seeing some indexing information actually on the edges, we can line that up with the numbers that are appearing on here. And once again, the numeric index is just using this 7421 to build up numbers. And so what's neat is since these are two digits with the 7421 encoding, that just needs two of these groups of four holes so they can encode between, what, zero and 100. Ooh, they go over 100. Maybe they have a third set. Doing it live. Um, anyway, they can encode a larger number using 
just eight holes instead of a hundred. And that's one of the little tricks that is done. The one of the things that made that made edge notch cards workable as a technology is that there's all these little tricks that go on to get the most out of the medium. 7421 encoding is one example of that, but there's quite a few. Another one, and you know, I'm not sure if these cards actually display it, but <clears throat> excuse me. Another trick that people did was called a code book or like a key book. And that would be kind of like how these cards function where they have uh, category information inside them. It would do a similar thing, but you'd have an external book. So instead of just having numbers and the category name, you'd have like a little notebook that you'd use as a guide to your data set. Like, kind of like a table of contents. What's neat about seeing the inline data here, how it has the indexing information and details on the cards, one, super useful for me, because if you don't have that indexing information, then, oh, here's some notches. Then you can't figure out what you're looking at. Um, just because, you know, the face is readable. The edges don't really have any context without... A description so that's interesting so this one like reading off this we have seven seven four two okay so they're using try punching um sometimes in certain schemas there's restrictions on how many holes you can punch or how many notches you can punch out of a certain section this one isn't following that so that's good to know so seven seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen and four so that would be this also looks like a bibliography entry where it's referencing a paper, the year of the paper, and then some information about it. So that would, let's see, Archin, I'm assuming 14 is going to be the important one. Oh man, I'm probably going to do that later when I actually have... Um, some more time and have these all digitized is go back and use a software called Tropy for managing um, photo data sets. I've been going through on some of the scans I have and trying to tease out the index information just on a few cards at least so I can understand what these are being used for. So like, yeah, here we go. This is another um, bibliographic card where it has just a short note information about the paper and then this must be more category information so i bet this is just a different part of the category another bibliography card so once i get these scanned it's gonna be really nice to go through and look at them um, but what i was saying about the index cards is actually i should adjust some of these papers I'll put this up. Loading, loading, loading. Um, I was stacking these wrong, so they got in reverse order. I just want to try to maintain the order they came in, so I have them in state somewhat. Probably doesn't really matter, but, you know, a little bit of worry. So what's interesting about these specific index cards that have the indexing details is if you notice, there are no notches in them. So that means that if you did any sort operation, these would come out, or these wouldn't come out. These would stay on whatever you're using. So like knitting needle, special sort needle, which means since there's no cuts, no notches, you could pull out the indexing information if it got shuffled into the pack. Of course, I'm not going to do that because like I keep harping on, these are are pretty unique they're very hard to find and while it is cardstock it's still paper so it's still delicate hence the gloves hence the digitizing hence the worry so this is another card that's really really cool um there's something that i've seen before where it looks like they're using paste and tape so they just cut out an abstract and a table here that's cool i haven't seen tables before um, and just put it on the card. 
that works fine because these are just processed by hand. There's no machine involved, so that won't get gummed up like a punch card would. Ooh, and there's back information. So that also gets scanned. That's the other thing about these, is since it's just kind of a dumb little thing, but since there's two sides, both faces can have written information or pictorial information on them. Ooh, it looks like a bunch of these are double-faced. Good thing I flipped these over. Um, that's in German. Well, the name's Germany. You know what I mean. Name isn't literally Germany, but it has the umlauts. Another cool thing that this is something that I just like to see in these card sets is on the back we have a copyright date and the actual information about the company. So these are sort system cards, right? Do, 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 do. Where does it say it? I just want to be right. Information retrieval system. Close enough. Why do I think these are sort system? Um, so there were a number of manufacturers that made these. Most manufacturers were located in the States. The big one, or the biggest one, was McBee, which was located in Ohio. Later changed and got absorbed into, oh, they're McBee and someone else. They got, they became part of a typewriter company in, I want to say the 60s. Royal McBee, that was the combination um, but what's interesting is these aren't McBee cards. These are, like I was saying, the information retrieval system cards, which, man, computers just don't like these. These are weird cards for stuff to auto scan. Um, but so it's interesting to see other OEMs, I guess not OEMs, but other manufacturers besides McBee, mainly because it shows that there was a diversity in this market. It was a mature enough and large enough technology that there was a reason to have more than one manufacturer. And that just lends more credence to the importance of this technology in a pretty generalized sense. The other interesting thing to note about this stack of cards that I'm actually very excited to see if they're using is these are double row. So that means, as you can see, they're perforated in, in an outside circumference and then on the inside also. So too deep. That means you can double down on, theoretically, on the amount of data stored on these cards or indexed on the edges of these cards. Man, these also don't want to scan. Um, so if you're careful with your indexing schema, then you can fit more information on the card edge. But the problem that arises is it gets kind of complicated, which is good. It's good to have a technology that can become more complex since then you can do more with it. But with the dual punches, this is where you start to run into needing custom or not custom, but specific hardware to deal with the technology. So in the case of these double deep rows, I've seen examples, so you can have a punch on the outside, like these so far are just punching on the exterior row. Oh man, this is, there we go, scanned. Um, so like I was saying, these look like they're just punched on the exterior. There's, the idea is that you can also do a deep punch where you punch the exterior and interior. So there's like a deep V. And then there's a third way you can do it where you just punch between two of them. So it's like an oblong shape, like an oval. That's, that's the name for an oblong circle. Um, but to do that, you need to have, since you're dealing with tighter constraints, you can't really, ooh, back notes. You can't as easily just do it with a pair of scissors. You have to have an actual punch. So, McBee, I know, I assume, information retrieval systems. Um, also, probably sold custom punches where they have punches that are tailored for these deeper indexed cards. And really, that just get back gets back to the 
This is a lot cheaper than punched cards since all the stuff you use with it is cheaper. It's all relatively general purpose. You don't have to have a super complicated tabulation machine to deal with these things. Do your magic. Oh man, I love modern technology. Sometimes it just doesn't want to play ball. There we go. Still haven't seen any of those deep punches. The other reason that these might be on these double hold cards is might just be an availability thing because I know some here we go um these double deep cards were common ish well, as common as this weird technology can be they're common enough that I wouldn't be surprised if the university where these notes were taken in this lab was if they just had some of these around and so it's like Oh, well, we use these index cards with the last researcher, so why not just use the same box that we have partway used? I could see that. Uh, probably never going to find out. <laughs> but, you know, speculation's okay as long as we don't use it as a basis for a large argument. Well, I guess we can use it as a basis, just got to be careful. There we go. I guess twisting makes this stuff register. Man, I was going through a bunch of scanning software and someone on Reddit said to just use the Windows 10 webcam thing. Since, like I was saying, I was struggling with the flatbed scanner. Um, it was working, but it was just real slow and a little inconsistent as printers are wont to do. But this is working great. And then, that's interesting. So, once again, looking at a punch card, which I can't pick up because I'm wearing gloves. Imagine a punch card. You can't draw a photo or a picture or anything on a punch card, but you can do that on an edge notched card. So these definitely work a lot better for notes, I think. That's, in my research, that's one of the big things these are good at is it's a playground. They're notes, they're cheap. You don't need a machine to use them. You can have a stack on your desk in a drawer and then you can also have a knitting needle somewhere nearby to handle them. I guess in that way it's more of a democratized technology kind of where come on, do it. Where it's something that according to some literature not literature, according to some ads an accountant or a secretary can learn how to use edge notch cards in as little as an hour and master the technology in under a day, which I kind of believe. Um, like I was saying, I've actually used those bird cards that I had on a little bit ago. Um, I've taken a needle to those and sorted out some of them a few times. And it's, it's a reasonably intuitive technology. Those bird cards that I had on the last stream are a little bit of a better example of just quick uptake because they have the index right next to the actual um, holes. Oh yeah, here we go. More notes. That's interesting. I wonder if that was a correction or if that was a mistake, like if they were gonna punch it and they just didn't. Oh, actually, I know what that is. Can't be sure because these don't have their own story written on them, but I've seen it written in some archaic journals. That must be what this is. So one of the major sources that I've been able to track down is finding scientific papers that mention the use of edge notched cards. And those are a great resource because they talk, since it's a scientific paper, about their methods. And they're like, well, you know, we collected our data on edge notch cards. We chose that instead of a journal or paper or punch cards for X, Y, Z reason. And then later they go into detail about their um, indexing schema, which, you know, th the important bits. But I remember reading in, ooh, this is a cool one. 
in one journal of forestry that was doing a woodland diagnostic survey, I think, um, that they, they're using the indexing to mark or to, to denote, um, different characteristics of tree samples. I remember reading that if something was weakly present, like if there was some feature, but it wasn't all the way there, they were marking, um, the hole as a notch with a pin, but not cutting it. Near as I can tell they were doing that because these, when you're doing this kind of stuff for a survey, the end goal is once you have all your notes done, you have all your data on cards, you can go through and compile it and you're still going through most of the cards and you can do something like, oh, I want to see all the hardwood trees and just pull out that whole stack. Um, and so you're using the indexing as like a guide and also a way of like quickly denoting information while you're in the field. So I could see that as a possibility where the marks that we're seeing on some of these were just notes for later survey information or might have been just eh, it you know it's kind of pcr category but it's also kind of not but i don't know i'll i'm not reading all of these right now my plan is to do that once they're in hyperspace and maybe i'll find out more then Ooh, another double-sided come on come on computer there the other just Thing that's kind of cool is seeing the Greek symbols because you know punch card you have to do strict encoding so if you're using usually it wasn't ASCII it was usually like EBXC or whatever that IBM standardized on so if you're using a punch card you know Greek symbols are not in the character set so you either have to have your own schema or just not use Greek symbols which, that's a detriment to someone working in the sciences. So I guess put, just put that in the file of little quality of life things that researchers got from using these cards. All right, single side on this one. More indexing. I, I just like seeing the little ridge where there's two notches right next to each other. It's kind of fun. And also, the reason we're archiving these, that's fragile. Boop. Come on. There we go. Perfect. This is actually making relatively quick work of these suckers. I'm really happy that I'm seeing so many of these cutouts paste it onto these cards. That's something that, so I've read a lot of guides from the era period pieces, you know, on using edge notched cards and none of them mentioned pasting um, clippings onto them, which led me to believe initially that it might be a kind of unique thing that some people were doing. Um, like I mentioned on the last stream, I think the Engelbart notes, he pasted um, news clippings and clippings from articles and little printouts onto certain cards. And so initially when I saw that, and I was like, ooh, well, this doesn't show up in the admittedly, admittedly antiquated literature, you know, might be unique to Doug, but it's totally not. I... These back it up more, and then I've seen other cards since that exhibit a similar kind of use case. Um, I was actually looking at a really... I got a cool set a few weeks ago digitized from UNC Chapel Hill that was a graveyard survey, and they had little Polaroids that were cut out and pasted onto the cards, which, once again, you can kind of do that with um, a punch card, but... You have to use these special punch cards that have a little window for putting a slide in or have space for microfilm. And I don't even know how expensive those were compared to normal punch cards. It's definitely a lot, a lot harder to do than just pasting something on a card. All right, that was bag one. Oh yeah, I guess I should mention these are 
sequestered away in Ziploc bags for their safety. I believe these are acid free. Should probably double check. These will be digitized, but they should should also be as preserved as possible. Because, you know, heritage of the world and all. Okay. Next set. So I believe that these were just, they just shipped in different bags. I think they're from the same set of notes. And yeah, we're still, there's nothing on that side. So I think I was seeing a similar kind of pattern on the last bag's worth where they're just using these three sides, but we'll see. Nothing on the back. So from looking at those index notes that were on the top at the very beginning, I have a feeling that all the indexing is probably just gonna be categorizing which makes sense. So these aren't using some of the more complex schemes that I have you know, haven't seen as much, but read more about um, where they're not doing like years or encoding a lot of data on the edge. There's a lot of reasons that they could be underutilizing the technology because really you can put quite a bit of data on these if you're careful about how you do it. Um, but there's a number of reasons that you wouldn't. One of those is you just don't want to. Like, that's work. That takes away from research time. And you have to think there's a certain calculus of, well, I'm using these newfangled cards for aiding my research, but, you know, I don't want the car using the cards to take up more time than just jotting notes. So that could be one reason. Another reason could be data duplication. Going back to some of the sources I've looked at, one of them specifically that I think lends credence to that theory is the survey methods paper. I know, very exciting. It's a paper on survey methods used for a series of tuberculosis surveys that took place in India in 1940, 1940 period, which oddly enough, during World War II, just as a fun aside, um, but they mentioned, that's a big hole. They mentioned that specifically in the instructions on how to use their cards, that anything that's on the edges doesn't go on the face. So you don't duplicate data. And so they'd have things like information about employment status or location or marital status, um, or age groups encoded on the edges, but then the face would just be like, their exact street address, their full name, the details that would be useful to a researcher, but not something you're going to be sorting by. And I guess the, the modern equivalent would be that, you know, if you're building a relational database, you're going to want to have a primary key. And so these can have a bunch of different primary keys, but you don't want to have 50 primary keys. You want to leave some of the stuff as just data. And so prevents duplication and makes your life a little easier since you don't have to do as much work. The other reason that we're not seeing more aggressive use of indexing on these is, or could be, can't say is since I don't know. Um, that was a bad scan. But it could be that, let me delete this really quick. Perfect. Oh, what was I saying? The other reason that we're not seeing aggressive indexing in these could be that they're pretty diverse. So some of these are bibliographic information. Some of them, like the one that had the graph on it, might be research notes, or probably research notes would be my guess just after scanning it. You know, scanning and scanning. Um, but in that case, you might not have enough similarities to really aggressively index. Because if you have research notes, those don't have a Dewey Decimal number. But if you have a bibliographic card, that doesn't have, like, you know, materials used in your experiment. Still love seeing little graphs on these. That's something that's very satisfying. 
Something else fun to note that's just about edge notch cards in general that I think is cool. I think all this technology is cool, but it's one of those little tricks that made these better to use. So like a punched card, they also have a corner cut. And so that ind indicates the cardiology, not cardiology, <laughs> the cardinal direction or whatever for how you're supposed to register these when you use them. So that's always up and to the left or right, depending on which side you're looking at. But one in other interesting thing you might not notice is these corners. So look very carefully at the corners on a few of these cards. The ones that aren't um, cut like that, they always have their holes. They're never notched. The reason for that, that found out reading a wonderful guide about personal indexing in the 21st century, or 20th century. It's so if you mess up your pack, if you drop your pack of cards, you can use a knitting needle or a sort needle to fix that. All you have to do is, if it has that registry notch on it, then, well, a needle's not going to stick to that, but it will stick to these. So... With four, well, three operations at most, you can realign your entire deck. Which, that's kind of important. It's definitely a little quality of life thing. But think about it. If you're dealing with these cards and the size of data sets, it kind of varies. Um, there's no hard and fast rule. I've seen some sourcing that says that these were practical up to 500 or 1,000 cards. I've also seen some sources that say they have larger sets that are just broken up into multiple drawers. So, I don't know. These could get... You could get a lot of cards. And you gotta think, if you drop those, that would ruin your day. So having just a little... It's simple. But having a small inbuilt way to fix that using just a card and a needle, that's pretty useful. I know on the show, I've definitely come across a lot of horror stories about grad students with their decks of um, punch cards running to submit them to the mainframe on campus. And on the way they trip, they drop their cards and they're, they're out of order. They're all strewn all over the place and they have to go through by hand and put them back together. You don't have to do that with Edge Nosh cards. There's... An inbuilt mechanism, of course, to get them registered back to normal. But you can also sort them. They're built to sort. I guess the sort thing I haven't elaborated on, that's because it's confusing. So I don't know. Once again, this comes down to sourcing isn't super good. I don't know how often people were using these for sorting or searching it's difficult to find a like a breakdown on use cases since no one recorded this stuff. That's one of the reasons that sourcing is so sparse. I mean, do you talk about what kind of graph paper you use or write down long diatribes about the specific weight and use case of different types of paper that you have in an office? Probably not. I mean, if you do, you're a very interesting person, I'm sure. But with these, people might not have sorted a whole lot. It might have just been like one of those features that's handy on occasion, but a little too complicated to use every day. Anyway, how the sort works comes down to the 7421 encoding that we see on every field on this deck. So by performing, this is basically a different, uh, it's a different superposition of binary encoding. Since binary would be similar to this, it's, what, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, where those are the weights for each digit. Do it. There. So you can do essentially a binary search using 7421. It's just a little bit different just because of the 7 instead of the 8. So people have different search algorithms. They're not really algorithms in the like more modern sense, but it's procedures for how you would sort 
a stack of cards. And I've seen a couple different ones, but usually it, it kind of sounds like bubble sort to me. Um, where, or I guess it's not bubble sort. It's, um, it's more basic than that. I'm not good at my algorithms. That wasn't my forte ever. But you can do a binary sort on these that's relatively simple. You find all the cards with one, then with two, then with three, then with four, then with seven on up. And so by doing that, you can sort. Um, it takes a few operations. It's not O sub N, which is nice. It's more like O sub however large the field is. So I guess these would be O sub 11. I think... I've seen examples of some procedures that are faster, but, oh man, that, I need to read more about that. Now that I actually have a little bit of breathing room where I don't have a whole lot of new sourcing coming in and I have, I'm getting all of these scanned, as you can see, I should have more time to go back and read some of the more deep cut stuff and get hammered out exactly how these are being sorted. But, you know, if it was me, I'd use these more for categorizing and storing reference numbers. Um, that's That might just be my modern brain talking, though. Because, you know, the whole reference thing is what's interesting to me. The idea that this cardstock system was being used something so similar to internet technology fascinates me to no bounds. I also love seeing the underlines on the clippings. That's just a fun little detail of like, oh yeah, they thought this part was important, but that part, extra important. Paste it on and underline it. It really shows, a, it's, I know it's kind of dumb, but it shows technology that's really personal and really used in a personal way. You can adapt it however you want. Whereas a punch card, you can't. It stores 80 columns of data. Data has to be encoded with zoning and very specific means. More pasting. That's big. Oh man, that is a bad scan. How did it do that? Yuck. Okay, do it. Yeah, still haven't seen any of the double deep punching. That's weird. So I guess the other circling back, oh, this is stuff on the back. Very nice. The other reason that they might not be punching these fully and really aggressively indexing it so I've seen some cards that are basically, they're notched to ribbons, like especially the ones in Engelbart's collection. Because, you know, he was pushing technology and a lot of his stuff was about finding the bounds of technology and finding inventive ways to use the technology. Oh, got to do what the card says. Over. But in the more general purpose use, people either might not have known about the better indexing schemas that were more complex for these cards, or they might have just not cared. And that, I have a personal pet theory that, you know, it's impossible to prove, but, excuse me, in my head it kind of makes sense. And that's that one of the reasons edge notch cards fell out of fashion, besides, you know, the personal computer <laughs> happening and sub thousand dollar computers was the fact that people didn't utilize them as well as they could have and i think part of part of the reason that makes sense to me is that this is a very manual technology you have to have a certain amount of skill it's kind of like how a slide rule is to a calculator this it would be like how an edge notch card is to a database right where if you have a database or you have a computer or even punch cards, you can, once you get in the groove and understand the technology, at least a little, it's all automated. You don't have to think about, oh, double deep. Um, but you don't have to think about the 
bits and bytes that make a database work. You just use a database. These, you have to think about that. You have to think about what kind of coding you're using. You have to think about what kind of categories you're using, what kind of indexes have already been used. And you have to consider the rest of your data set. You have to be like part of the database. This is your data, but you still have to be the logic part of it. And building schemas even for databases is a real pain. No one likes it. I like it sometimes. Very few people like designing schemas for databases. You don't sit around and do that on a Sunday for fun. But I think similarly, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of people just wanted to research and didn't want to deal with making really complicated schemas. So when computers came out and when they could get access to computers, that must have been a godsend. It's like, hey, just put it in the database. Also, note on this card. Don't know if you can see that very well. That's a repair. So that's, let me see. That's just tape. A, so that's exciting. I know, little bitty tape repair is exciting. What's interesting about this to me is I've seen, looking through trade journals of the era, cause there's a bunch, I've seen ads for little repair holes. It's kind of like the little um, repair stickers you can get for binders that you use to fix a uh, accidentally messed up notch. And part of the reason, so one, why would you be repairing these cards? Well, they're useful. You're gonna be using it more than once. That's why you have the indexing in the first place is so you can go back to your notes and you can do something with it. Who knows what you're gonna do? Do whatever you want, but you're gonna do something. So if you make a mistake, you wanna fix it. Otherwise, you'd have to throw out the whole card and that kinda sucks. So one option was to buy low repair things, but seeing that that's repaired with tape, I haven't seen that before. I've seen some that are repaired with little kits, but with just scotch tape, that is actually cool. All these little things, it's like the underlining on some of the notes. Um, to me, it's showing a really lived in technology. This is something that's very personal. Maybe they didn't have the repair kit or maybe this researcher um, had the repair kit around or just just didn't want to bother with it. It was just like, oh, I'm working fast. I can just fix this now and it'll be a, it won't be a problem. It's such a wide hole. And of course it doesn't scan. Ooh. So it, it's just neat. All these little touches are things that you won't, well, you won't read about at all because edge notch cards aren't written about very much except by freaks like me, but you, at least I haven't seen in any of the old scholarship, old trade journals and um, ephemera around these. And it's neat. It, it's kind of like oral history. There's all these little things that aren't written down. Like, you know, what width and I don't know, what width, what weight of paper a certain office used. Um, this is a similar way where there's a bunch of little colloquial things that people did, but didn't necessarily talk about. There's another interesting one. Okay, so where'd it go? Tin foil hat time. Notice that big chonker I was talking about? That's the same width. I wonder if that broke. That's interesting. That so this would be another weird colloquial thing that people didn't write in manuals. <clears throat> Something I've noticed on some cards is when you have this kind of indexing where you have little spikes, those can bend really easily. I'm not gonna show you because I'm not gonna bend this. That would be bad. But imagine, that's very thin paper that can bend. And I've seen some cards where that bends and it can get gummed up in other cards. So I wonder if that happened here and the researcher was just like, ah, screw it, I'll just cut them all out. Because that still works exactly the same as that. It just doesn't have little ridges. That's interesting. It's interesting to me. All right, back on the train. Doop. 
I guess the peekaboo thing works. Man, I don't know. I don't like computers. For someone who works on computers and writes about computers and talks about computers, I... Man, computers and me don't get along as well as we should. Do Come on. Do it. Show up. There. Peekaboo works sometimes. Is that food? Oh, man. That appears to be either dried rubber band or dried food. Preserved under tape. Chef kiss. Beautiful. Maybe that can be some dinner for me. I'm joking. Upside down. This is weird. All of these so far have been pretty methodical. This one has upside down text. That's weird. I don't know why they do that. There's a registry mark right there. I, the indexing doesn't look backwards. If this was all upside down, I'd expect holes or notches here. That's weird. Huh. Guess it was just convenient at the time. More, more, more. Silver nitrate. Good stuff. I am really happy to see this deck. This is... I haven't gotten to look through a whole lot of personal notes that were kept on these because, I mean, how many of you have kept a notebook from high school or something or from college? Once you're done, you're done. Not a lot of these, or at least I don't think a lot of these were kept around. Also just cool seeing a correction. Um, these are really kind of ephemera because... Besides things like the Guide to Eastern Land Birds or similar pre-printed packings, which, gotta stress this, I can't stress this enough, the pre-printed cards aren't very common. These already aren't common. The company that made those bird cards, they made a couple other sets for different birds in different regions and different trees. And then I've heard Prey tell that some journal, I forget what one, but a chemistry journal put out publications on cards. And there's also one that I've seen a couple cards from um, that was a textbook on edge notch cards. But it's very rare to see printed ones. These are mainly used for notes. Anyway, don't know where I was going with that. But that, that's the deck. So yeah. Thanks for joining me on my day off to digitize edge notched cards. If you like learning about the history of computers, then you can subscribe here. I do a podcast. That's mainly what I do. This is my first time streaming anything. I just felt like if I'm putting this much time in this, I might as well share it. Um, but if you'd like to hear more about the history of computing and the somewhat subversive or subversive in my mind history of computing and stuff that people don't talk about as much in computing lore, then why not check out the podcast? It's called Advent of Computing and it's available anywhere you listen to podcasts. All right, that's going to be it for me today. I'll catch y'all on the flip side.